been spending some time on the Psalm 139. And uh, I want to apologize to Rob. Uh, you know, some of his thunder. I wasn't really aware that next week he was going to be wrapping up. So part of what I have to say you know, includes the wrap up. But this way you'll hear it twice and that way it gets fixed in your mind. Good thing. So the, the part that I have been assigned and, and before I actually read it to you, I want to just just want to remind you that, that if, if you were to actually write a paper about this, you'd have to make a thesis statement. And the thesis statement is what the thing is about. And, and, and this is what the commentary said. I thought it was pretty good, so I'll quote it to you. The omniscience, all-knowing, and omnipotence, all-powerful, of the sovereign creator is a great comfort to those who are loyal to him and a stern warning to those who oppose him. It's like the gospel. The gospel is there to comfort the afflicted. If you're afflicted, don't worry, Jesus' blood covers it. And if you're comfortable, it's come to afflict the comfortable. So the gospel afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. If you think that sin is okay, if you think that your life deviating from the, the revealed will of God is okay, and you don't know much about God or the Holy Spirit. You open your heart to him, he's going to come and take you to the woodshed. He will, he knows how to do it. I've been there many times. So that's really what this message is, is, is about. It opens up with search me, know my heart. And actually, as I, uh, I was able to say a couple of weeks ago, you know, the psalmist is not real comfortable with that. Uh, he says, your hand is on me, and it's a picture of a cupped hand trapped on top of a kitchen table. You know, I can't get away from you. Where can I go to get away from God? You know, there's a lot of people who are doing, trying to do exactly that, get away. I've done a little running in my time, too. And you know what? He knows exactly where to find us. You know, he knows, he knows who we are, he knows where we are, and he knows what we are. Absolutely knows it better than we know ourselves. And the second strophe, or the second stanza in there, will tell us that he's, he's not only knows where we are and that we can't get away from him, but he has known that from eternity, from before the time we were ever born. You saw my unformed frame. Well, yet I, you, know, you knew my words that were coming out of my mouth before every one of them came to be. Now that's, that's hard for us to, I mean, it just is. We just accept that it is. God knows it. And uh, so, you know, this is not something that is, that's new. You know, in, in, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, you've got five different times Jesus says to the church, I know your works. I know your works. You know, and, and for several of those times, it was not a comfortable knowing I know, I know you, and I know what you're doing, and I don't like it. And he has every right to say that to us. And other times he says, I know, I know your affliction. I know your persecution. I know your pain. I know about that. I know where you are at the seat of Satan. You know, you couldn't have said that about America 25 years ago. You can sure say it today. You know? The things that were going on at the time when this psalm was written were bad. We think that paganism and child sacrifice that's going on today is something that's recent. It's not. It's been going on. And during the time that the psalmist was writing, it was going on a lot. It was not until state sanctioned paganism and state sanctioned child sacrifice came about that God began to really come down and Israel and tell them, hey, you're my bride, but you're going to pay for this. 
And um, it, it was actually during the reign of Solomon that we actually have altars to Molech on the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem. That Solomon, the wisest man on earth, built. You know, do you think that the church today is is uh, immune from the kind of idolatry that was going on then? You need to think again. Ask God to open your eyes. You know. Okay. So, and as far as you know. Matthew 10, 29, even the hairs of your head are numbered. God has known us, knows all about us. That's Jesus reiterating the same idea of this psalm. Even the hairs of your head were numbered. Matthew 10, 29. Matthew 28, 20. Behold, this is the very last verse, of the very last chapter of Matthew. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. He's with us. And in Acts 17, 24 to 28, it's, it's actually a pricey. I'd like to turn there and look at that. There's a Bible in your pew, you Acts, A-X, Acts 17. And just as, it, as you read Psalm 129, here's, here is Paul reiterating on Mars Hill the same principles that are set forth. That God created us, that God knows us, and that God expects our worship, everything that we have. So, in verse 24 of chapter 17 of the book of Acts, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on, on, all, on all the face of the earth. Having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. He is transcendent, overall, sovereign, and he is imminent. He is sovereign, and he knows everything from the beginning. But he holds us accountable for our choices. God is sovereign, and our choices matter. It's a paradox, but there's a lot of paradoxes in the Bible. Believe me, God's got it figured out. He's got it figured out. The divine decrees are not fatalism. The fact that he is sovereign does not mean that what you've done and what you say is predetermined and therefore you don't have any choice and therefore you're not to be blamed. Your choices matter. And God already knows your heart. He knows the words on your heart. You can actually make a choice that matters. So how do we put that together? You know, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. John Calvin was right, or with uh, or Jacob Arminius, you know, and I would just have to say yes. Neither one of them were right. God is right. He is sovereign, and our choices matter. That's what the Book of Psalms teaches, because he he makes a turn. He makes a turn in the. Um, He says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Verse 17 of, of Psalm 139. How vast is the sum of them. How precious to me are your thoughts. The, the Hebrew word pictures a gem, a very precious gem worth a lot of money. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they're more than the sand. It's a euphemism. More than anything, we could count. You know, you can't count the grains of sand on the sea, but I don't think he meant exactly that. He means more than we could ever imagine. If I could count, if I could count them, they're more than the sand of the sea. I awake, and I'm still with you. I, I awake. It could mean awake from sleep. It could mean awake from dead, death. 
It could mean, as in this particular case, awake from this meditation. You've been meditating on God. You know, you'll never find a perfect church. And if you did, it would cease to be so the moment you walked through the door. You'll never find a perfect church, but you can find a perfect Savior. And the good news of the gospel is we can know him. You know, doctrine is important. Doctrine is important. It informs us and enables us to worship in a right manner. But doctrine is not knowing him. Doctrine is knowing about him. We need to know about him. But more importantly, we need to know him. There are people who have terrible doctrine that know him a lot better than I probably ever will. There are people who are barely literate who walk with the Lord in a manner that I never have. We can only pray to know him better in my life. That's what, that's what the psalmist is, is, is after here. Knowing God. Knowing God, not knowing the church. A lot of people have rejected God because they really, they're rejecting the church. They never really knew God. They just knew the church. And they said, mm, I don't want that. Of course, you know, we try to cover our failures by saying, well, you know, the church is a hospital for sinners. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. But you know what? It's there that the presence of Christ lives. We are the temple of God. You know, all this talk about rebuilding a temple, we're the temple. The Holy Spirit indwells us and we are the temple of God. What's the temple? The temple is God's house. Well, what's God's house? That's the place where he rests. And on the seventh day, he rested. You know, you kick off your shoes and throw them on the floor. Dance in the kitchen till the morning light. Louisiana Saturday night. Yeah, well, that's, that's home. That's home. Even, even that song's a picture of home. Very homey song. You know, I could, I could put my feet up on the coffee table and feel perfectly okay. So my wife came in. But that's home. Well, the temple is God's home. Eden was God's home. That's where he, the center, his headquarters, his center of operation. You know? And then sin entered. And so the great controversy and the great conflict of the ages begins. And then you have his return. Uh, and he chooses Abraham of all the nations to be his, the progenitor of his nation, his people, his prized possession. And then, then you have the tabernacle and he comes down into the tabernacle and that's his place of residence in a manner that human beings could relate to because he wants to share his home with you and me. Share his home because why? We are his Adopted children, Romans 8. Okay, are you with me on this? And so, this psalm is about someone who's meditating on the person of God and his desire to know God and to know, and, and he's communicating through that meditation attributes of God that we need to remember. His omniscience, his omnipotence. We may not always understand what God does, but the, but the word of the Lord tells us that it's safe to trust him. It's safe to trust his word. It may lead us to places that makes us uncomfortable, but in the end. So, he says, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Wow, what a turn. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Yeah, I feel that way sometimes too, especially when they pull in front of me. Oh, men of blood, depart from me. That's a, that's a command. That's an imperative. Get out of my sight. Get away. And it's bloodthirsty men. It's men who are bloodthirsty. 
They speak against you with malicious intent. These are your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? You know, they speak him. They speak him with malicious intent is actually that's awkward construction in English, but it's not written in English. It's written in Hebrew. But the idea is that these are people, and, and the hatred, the, the word for hatred, the word that he says, I hate, is in a particular tense that means, it's, as it's used in Scripture, it's used the same way that Malachi 1.1 says, I have loved Jacob and I have hated Esau. What does he mean? You know, uh, so, you know, Romans in chapter 9 tells us that, you know, God chose, he chose Jacob, and he didn't choose Esau. He hated him. He loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. So the hate that we're talking about is just non, non-elect, not, not chosen, okay? And that's the same way he says, I hate them. You know, I choose to be away from them. I don't want to be around them. Okay, but when it says they, I hate those who hate you, they're in what's called in Hebrew pl. It's the same word, but it's in a tense of intensification. These are people who hate you and all that you stand for with an intensive hate. Them I hate. I don't want to be around them. I don't want to catch their disease. Well, I don't know if it actually means that. It just certainly means that he, choo- he, he chooses to not choose them also, okay? So, so it doesn't carry quite the abruptness that w- when we see, we would, we would attribute to that word hate. You know, I choose you, O Yahweh. I choose you and your way, not them and their way, because they're malicious and they speak of you They speak about you in a deceitful way. You know of any of that going on these days? Are there people speaking about God and and using the things of God in a deceitful way in order to accomplish purposes that they have that are not in alignment with God's purpose? Yeah, we see it all the time. I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. If they're your enemies, they're my enemies. You know, whatever you say, God, I say. Whatever you don't say, I don't say. But then he goes, search me, O God. I'm sorry, guys. I have to go here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. You see, he didn't even trust himself. He didn't even trust himself. Try me. And know my thoughts. It's it's an intimate knowledge, yada, to know. It's the most intimate knowing that you can have. It's the same way that Adam yada his wife Eve when she conceived and bore a son. Search me and know my heart. And see if there be any grievous way in me. Actually, it's a painful way. A way that causes pain. A way that brings pain. You know, there have been times in my life when uh, I've been brought under conviction that things that I did and things that I said brought pain to those that I love the most. That's, that's hurtful. That's hurtful to me. It's hurtful to them. And it carried ripples out beyond just the words that left my mouth. And lead me in the way everlasting. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, Psalm 23. So, I want to just look at a couple of texts. And we read Acts 17, talking about the capraci of Psalm 139, of the whole psalm. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is kind of a parallel in the New Testament as to what the psalmist is, is 
is expressing and this this hatred of those this choosing choosing not choosing the crooked way the wicked way the twisted way you know that word wicked you ever seen wicked wicker wicker the same root same anglo-saxon word root it's wicker it's twisted you have to twist the reed and turn it that's what the word wicked means twisted so this is a this is a Paul talking to the Corinthians, Gentiles, by the way. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing and I will welcome you and will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, that that quote originates, actually, in Leviticus chapter 26, and it's repeated periodically. God repeats himself. The same principles that we see in Psalm 139 are, th are repeated throughout all of Scripture. Again and again, I'd like to look at a couple of those. Because that's what he told the Israelites when they went into the promised land. He says, be separate from them. Tear down the Asherah. Tear down the Baal altars. Tear down the high places. Don't go into covenant relationship with any of those people. As a matter of fact, kill every last one of them. And of course, that's all connected with Genesis 6 4, and as much as I'd like to go there, I won't. But the thing is, they didn't do that. They did not tear down the Asherah poles. They did not tear down the Baal altars. They did enter into covenant with the people of the land who worshiped Molech and Ashtoreth and Baal and all of the things that in developed from there. And they did not not touch unclean things. And so you get that all through the prophets. Brothers and sisters, we're in exactly the same today nothing's changed evil has not changed human nature has not changed one thing that has changed we're on this side of the cross and we have forgiveness we have moral standing before God you know in the whole book of Leviticus there is not one sacrifice for moral sin there was no sacrifice for adultery. There was no sacrifice for murder. If you were guilty, you died. Or you were outside the covenant. You left the community. It was about sacred space. It was about uncleanness. It was about being able to come into sacred space. Read it. But look what he says. Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I know you were probably reading there last night. Leviticus 26. And he's, this is talking about, this is the chapter that talks about all of the blessings that God would bring to his people if they would obey him, if they would walk in the covenant that he made with him. And look what he says. Verse 11, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Well, that's a, quite a statement. I will not, I will not find you disgusting as you really are. That's, a, that's what he's saying. Can you imagine saying that to somebody today? My soul will, but he's holy. He is holy, and he's communicating to them what holiness is, is all about. You cannot come even in my presence without holiness. And we have none in ourselves. 
but he has provided one himself who is holy. God himself will provide a lamb, he told Abraham. And so it was God's lamb that paid the price. I, my soul and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. And the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves and have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Okay, that's Leviticus 29. Uh, Exodus 29 is saying the same thing. He repeats himself. And God never re repeats himself just because he likes to hear himself talk, like I do. Leviticus, I mean, Exodus 29, verse 45. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And then Jeremiah 31, 33. That's a very, very familiar uh, text to, to a lot of us. This is after after all of the bad news that Jeremiah had to bring. He brings this this prophecy that's quoted twice in the book of Hebrews. 31, 33. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Okay, that's us. They shall all know me. I'll walk among them. I will be in their midst. Do you know? Do you believe? That God is walking in our midst when we gather here to worship him? Maybe sometimes we ought to pay a little more attention. Okay, I'm getting in trouble now. Ezekiel 11.20. Now this is interesting because most, most of the time people go to Ezekiel 36, 26. But here's Ezekiel 11. Verse 18, and when they come there, I'm sorry, when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And if you really want a thrill, you need to read about the first 23 chapters of, of Ezekiel and see just what those abominations were and just what God's response to them was. That's uh, pretty scatological. And I will give them one heart. And a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. I bet you didn't know that was in Ezekiel 11. He repeats it later. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Okay. It's also in... in Chapter 14, I'm running out of time, so I can't go there. Verse 11 and, and 36, 28 and 37, 27. He, he repeats it to them. It's because there was a wicked way in the people of God. They never completely followed him. And um, unfortunately... After Daniel comes Hosea, you know, and Hosea is called the, the divorce lawyer. He's the, the covenant divorce lawyer. <laughs> and look what he says. He, he says, when she had weaned no mercy, this is verse uh, 8, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord called, said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. You have grossed me out so much that I can't even walk amongst you anymore. I can't even be your God, and you are not my people. 
And then he says an interesting thing, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Now that's an interesting quote that we find in another place. I'll go there in a minute. But he, he repeats this again in chapter 2. He says, and I will sow her, in verse 23, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. This pertains, if you want to go to Romans, That mark somewhere in here. Romans chapter 9. Yes. Us Reformed people like to go there a lot. Romans chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. Even as he has called not only from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. That's us. As indeed Hosea says, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. So that text and those words about walking in their midst is not just for the Jews. It's for the people of God. The people of God by election and by faith in the old covenant and those grafted in from the wild olive shoots under the new covenant. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God and daughters of the living God. Okay, I'm running out of time here. First Peter essentially says the same thing. He quotes Hosea. He says, you, you who are not my people, you are not beloved. Now you're beloved. See, because there's blood, because there's atonement, because Emmanuel has come, the son of David. And he has enabled us to enter sacred space without grossing God out because we are covered in the blood. We are in Christ. Christ is our mediator. Christ is our goel. He's the one that comes to redeem the the alienated property. The last text I want to go to is in Revelation chapter 21. Just to show you how this is. The last chapter of the Bible. Verse 3. Some of you might want to meditate on this one because it's been a hard week for a lot of folks in this church. And behold... I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. You heard that before? It's repeated again and again and again. God's purposes know no frustration. God's original purpose in Eden will be reinstituted an octave higher. His house will be on earth, and his children will be with him. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall they be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. We are heir. Of this. We are heirs of this. This is our destination. You're in the already, but not yet. Your faith has laid hold. This is what Psalm 139 is saying. We cannot be perfect. Look at David. He certainly wasn't perfect, but I'll tell you what, he never worshiped another God. Believing loyalty. We can be perfectly loyal to the one who has bought our redemption with his own blood. 
who has spoken to us throughout the entire scripture. If you want to know the New Testament, get familiar with the Old Testament because it's full of Old Testament references. And those first apostles, those first Jews, and even those believing Gentiles who had the Septuagint, it was no New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. It was all Old Testament. And the Spirit of God came and lit up the text. We barely even read the New Testament, much less the Old Testament. I'm just saying, there's so much in here. There's so much. And it, and it, and it culminates in the person of Christ, in the cross, in the blood, in the gospel. It comes to comfort us in our affliction. It comforts us in our affliction. Because he will wipe away every tear. His dwelling place will be with men. It is with man. We are the temple. He is here. But when he comes again, he'll be here in a way that we could never have imagined. He'll wipe away every tear, and there'll be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. The only thing is a passage.